Uh, okay, so uh, I called my talk Plan 9, the better Unix. Uh, and it's actually, I actually jumped in to give this talk now because somebody got sick. And uh, it's a talk I'd given before somewhere else, so it's, uh, it's recycled in a way. And I had, didn't have much time to prepare it, but I think uh, it'll be fine. Um, so uh, I'm going to start with with some slides, and then we later uh, see see the system in action. Uh, so Plan Nine uh, was uh, was meant to be the successor to Unix, um, and it was developed at Bell Labs by mostly the same people people who also did Unix. Um, and you can think of it as uh, pretty much Unix plus graphics and network and some improvements like the lessons learned. Um, it was written by uh, mostly Rob Pike and Ken Thompson, who like they did the the initial uh, basic system and uh, uh, concepts, and then other people like Dave Presato, how tricky, Phil Winterbottom, and others uh, fleshed out the system and uh, implemented various aspects of it. Um, they started in the 1980s, um, and by 1992, the first edition. Uh, was released uh, to universities. Um, then three years later, the second edition was released um, to a more, like to a wider um, a public, but it was, uh, you, you couldn't use it commercially. Then in 2000, um, it was released under, the third edition was released under some uh, pseudo open source license, uh, which was not quite what people were happy with, and then 2002, the fourth edition uh, was uh, released under the Lucent Public License, which was a free license, but still incompatible with GPL, and people were still not quite happy with that either. And that was the last release from Bell Labs, um, and people started uh, because the uh, was not really uh, developed further after that point, at least not so much. So people started forking it or um, putting in their own improvements, and there were some projects. Nine Atom uh, is no longer uh, doesn't exist anymore. I think Nine Front is still going, and this is this is like the main uh, the main place where Plan Nine development still happens. I think, and Nine Legacy is like a set of patches on top of the original Bell Labs Plan Nine. Um, to sort of keep the original system running. Um, and then only 2021, uh, the Plan 9 Foundation was uh, founded, and the whole code was uh, relicensed under uh, MIT uh, license. Okay, so we start with Unix. Um, the user interface on a Unix system uh, was originally a teletype, like you can see here. Um, and there was a very neat hack in the kernel because Unix had this concept of everything is a file, um, and particular devices are represented as files. So there was a file uh, devtty, which always refers to the current teletype that one is working on. And this was a, a hack in the kernel. Uh, the kernel knows which tty a process uh, runs on, like which, which one it, it, it's attached to, and it gives this file devtty a different meaning depending on which process is opening the file or reading the file or whatever. So you can see there is devtty0 and 1, and these are absolute names, so to speak. They d refer to one concrete teletype. But devtty uh, always refers to the current one. So if like, uh, Dennis here uh, sits down next to Ken, then he will also have a devtty, but it's a different one. Um, but that was pretty much a hack in the kernel um, yeah and uh, it was it was a nice idea though um, in the late well maybe in the early 80s uh, graphics started to happen and um, uh, um, Rob Pike and uh, Bart Locanthi uh, built this uh, blit terminal uh, which you can see a, a photo of here and it was uh, well, like, like, like a teletype, but graphical, of course, with the keyboard and mouse and a screen. Um, but it was still a terminal, uh, which connected to a Unix machine. Um, the uh, user interface was inspired by Smalltalk and the uh, PERC computer. 
Um, but the Perk was a workstation. Um, and they took this name Perk, and because they were not very happy with it, they called their version the Jerk. But that was not uh, commercially viable, so when AT&T decided to make a product out of it, they called it the Blit. Um, after the bit blit operation to put pixels on a screen. Uh, so this was a terminal, not a workstation. Um, it, it had to connect to a Unix system to do anything useful. Um, but still it needed a, uh, like a, a small tiny operating system on that uh, blit um, to do like the windows and uh, the terminal emulation, so to speak. It's not a terminal emulator like, uh, like we, we use now which are essentially like VT100s. Uh, uh, these are just windows with text, pretty much, not, not proper terminals. Um, and it was connected to Unix uh, machine. And this, uh, and this Unix then needed some kind of pseudo TTY uh, files, like we also have with SSH now or something. Um, but previously, that didn't exist because you just had the hard copy terminal or, or a video terminal. Um, and the the essential idea of this uh, of this system was that uh, every window, uh, like you have you have one screen and one mouse and one keyboard, but if you have window windows on that screen, you kind of it's it's like you're multiplexing these things, and every window just gets its own view of the mouse and its own view of the keyboard. Like when I'm in a different window and I type something, the other windows don't see that. Um, and, and pretty much everything has the same view of the system. They all have a, a screen, which is their own window, and a, a keyboard, which is the keys that they get when the window is active, and similar with a mouse. Um, and I, I could show a demo of this, um, but I, I don't know, maybe later, it depends on the time. Um, so that was like a, a very basic operating system. Um, and you still have this distinction between Unix and the terminal. Uh, so Rob Pike started uh, writing, well, first of all, they, they built a second machine, the Not, and uh, it's, it's like an iteration on the Blit design, it's a bit more powerful and so on. Uh, and uh, Rob Pike experimented with an operating system for that machine, and there were two main ideas. Um, the one, the, the first one is that uh, in Unix, you have this file tree which looks the same for everyone. Like you go from the root directory and then directory slash directory and so on. Um, and uh, the new idea was that every process could have uh, its own view of the uh, of the file system. Um, so, for instance, the reason that uh, that the mount system call in Unix needs root permissions is because it changes the like the global state of things for everyone. And Plan 9, uh, mount is not a privileged thing. Everyone can do it because they only change their own view of the system. And um, also the file system is not made up of like these persistent files on disk or device files, but uh, anything that looks like a file pretty much. And the kernel can mount different file servers uh, to different parts in the file tree and build up their view, their namespace, um, like that. Um, and the kernel needs some, some file servers built in, like for the hardware, for, um, for a mouse, for a screen, for uh, maybe a serial or a network connection, um, and, and that's it. And then, and that's enough to talk to a Unix system, for instance, in this early time it was a Unix system, um, to mount like files on disk, like a, like a Unix file server, like source code, binaries, and so on. Um, but at this point, it was still two different systems again. Um, and uh, some, some of the, like this DevTTY hack was kind of... Uh, like the idea was nice, but it was changed. Uh, first of all, it, it's split up now because we have graphics. So dev cons is pretty much the keyboard, dev mouse is the mouse, and bit blit is a uh, bit blit and window is for the graphics. Um, but now the important difference is 
that previously we had dev TTY, which was a single file which looked differently depending on the process, but dev cons is always a different file, but it always has the same name. So a, a so program just opens dev cons and reads from the keyboard, um, but it could be the real keyboard, like the hardware keyboard, or it could be the multiplexed keyboard that that that's connected to a single window only, um, and the the power of the namespace uh, allows for the for different files to have the same name, um, and that system evolved and became Plan Nine, and by 1990, it's uh, they were able to use it like for productive use. They had the not terminals. Um, from uh, like built from uh, 68k uh, CPUs, uh, CPU servers which ran proper programs like compilers and everything, um, and that was uh, SGI MIPS uh, based at the time. And the file server was originally on a different machine, on a Unix machine, still running on a VAX. Um, and they have a, they had the Windows system eight and a half named after the movie, uh, the SAM text editor, which was also graphical, still is, a new shell, the RC shell, uh, which is also still the shell in Plan 9 today, uh, and a new C compiler and C library, and some kind of POSIX compatibility layer, APE. Uh, yeah, and later it was, it was ported to more hardware like uh, Intel, Spark, PowerPC, Alpha, and so on, and the file server still remained a separate thing uh, early on, um, like a, a separate kernel, but it became a, a user space program later. So now let's take a look at the system calls. Um, these are around 40 system calls uh, compared to Linux with 450, and Windows NT4 with around 200, and then 500 more for the graphics stuff that went into the kernel at some point. Uh, this is pretty minimal. And uh, we have pretty much, well, standard system calls to d deal with processes, with memory, with a file system, files, uh, nodes, which is the Plan 9 uh, equivalent to signals, and semaphores, uh, which were actually let at a later, if I'm not uh, mistaken, for, for a synchronization. Uh, Rendezvous is the, the preferred way, I think, to do uh, synchronization stuff. And notice there are pretty much two... Uh, do I have a slide for this? Yeah. Uh, notice there is no ioctals, so, and also no sockets or network, uh, no graphics. This is all done uh, through the file system. Uh, yeah, the main difference is to Unix, like th these are almost what you would expect from a standard Unix system, but there, there are uh, a few differences. Uh, R fork is the first one. Unix has fork, and R fork is, uh, is, is more, more powerful, as we will see. And there is bind, um, which is new, and, and yeah, mount, and mount ha has some uh, changed semantics, but it's pretty much these three that are the difference. Um, so bind, uh, takes uh, takes one file uh, and or one name. Um, well, uh, yeah. Well, as I explained, um, I don't know why it's called old, but uh, you take uh, you take a name that exists already on the system, and you give it a new name, and then it's also available under that name. Um, and with a flag, you can. Uh, you can, there's like, a, you have, um, you, you have an order, like, you can mount before, you can bind before or you can bind after, um, uh, because you can mount multiple things to the same name. And this is useful, for instance, for uh, ha uh, having binaries in different directories, and Unix has this path variable in the shell for this, and it will look up every directory and until it finds the binary. And in Plan 9, you can just use the file system for it. Uh, you just bind all the locations that you have your binaries in, uh, you bind them under a slash bin, and then everything is visible under slash bin, and you don't need any, any path variable anymore. Uh, and this, this is called the union bind, because you see everything that you bound to this location. Uh, 
This is what bind does. Um, something fun you can do. In a sec, uh, something fun you can do is uh, if you have a, a different system mounted um, over the network, or well, if you have access to the, the 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 file system of a different machine, you can use that slash net. Uh, directory of the other machine and bind it over your own slash net and then you're using the network of that other machine. It's, it's sort of like a VPN and it's just one line in plan nine uh, well uh, like a shell command and, and you get uh, some really fancy stuff. Do you have a question? I'm not Uh, yeah, if that's like an empty file or something, then you can hide it, yes. And mount, um, it sort of works like, uh, sort of works like Unix mount, where you g give a, uh, a device file to it, and then you mount it in some directory, but in this case it's not a device file, but it's a, uh, it's a file descriptor that speaks the 9P protocol, which is the, the file uh, protocol that that's like sp is spread all all over Plan Nine, um, and you can do authentication as well over the uh, A file descriptor, but that's not so interesting for us right now, I think. Um, so one example is you mount uh, Rio, which is the Windows system. Uh, there is a file that it serves, which speaks 9P, and you can mount that server under, for instance, mount foo, uh, and you give it an argument. That's the A name in the um, in the call, uh, and if that's new, it will create a new window. Uh, and you will have it available under mount foo, so a window has uh, multiple files, we'll, we'll see that later. Actually, I think we can just try it out now. So, so we have, uh, this is just the normal way to make a window, and we can, we can go to here, and let's say mount serve uh, mount foo new, and here I have my window. And now if I go to mount foo, uh, I see all the files that are associated with that window, and now I can say something like, uh, hello vcfb, and it will uh, display in the window. Um, and if I mount this con, well, I, I I'm not going to experiment now, <laughs> but I could like take over the window. I just start a shell which connects its standard input and output to this uh, cons file of that new window, and it will run in that window. Um, okay, so the idea is bind copy something to another place, something that already exists, mount add something new to the namespace, and unmount uh, removes that. And I can uh, check all the. I can check how my namespace was constructed with the ns uh, command, which is like lsps, and this is ns. So you can see uh, the. Where is it? So these uh, these hash uh, thingies are uh, kernel devices, so the kernel knows about those directly. So uh, hash c is, uh, is the device. Uh, the device directory and hash these for file descriptors and so on, and these have pretty fancy characters in some cases. Uh, no, uh, C is not the C is the sorry C is the cons uh, the device. So this is like the keyboard, and uh, we can actually just take a look at what uh, uh, hash C is. Um, so this is uh, this is what hash C gives us. And if I uh, check out the, the whole, I, I get more. Uh, and also notice that because it's a union mount, the same name appears multiple times. But you only get the, like, the, the last one, the latest one. You can't access the, the previous ones. And that's why there are these before and after arguments. So you can control in which order your uh, namespace is constructed. OK. OK, now let, let's check, uh, check out our fork. Um, so in Unix, fork just copies the, the process completely with all resources like file descriptors. Um, and it just creates a new process. 
and our fork is uh, allows for more granularity. So what's called a so you can you can give it flags what to fork. So you can fork a process, and this is uh, what would normally be called a thread. So it's a different thread of execution. Uh, you can also fork memory. Uh, this would turn a thread in the same program uh, and give it a different um, memory map. So it, it, this would split the process, like sp split the threads into what would be called processes and and normal uh, using normal usual terms. Um, you can fork the namespace, so processes can share namespaces or they can be in separate namespaces. Uh, environment for environment variables, uh, nodes, as I said, like signals and Unix, and they will be in different signal groups and so on, file descriptors and rendezvous groups as well. So these are more Plan 9 specific. Um, but this process and memory uh, thing uh, is, uh, is more general than what you have like in Mac or in T, uh, where you have just this distinction between threads and processes. In Plan 9, this is all all kind of the same thing, and you just give fork different uh, different flags what to fork. So this is pretty powerful. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. I don't think it's about resource usage. Um, I wouldn't say that. Um, yeah, I think it's just uh, it's like reflecting reflecting on fork. Okay, what does fork do? It, it forks a process, and I get two processes. But I have more stuff that maybe maybe I want to keep some part of it, and maybe I want to split like fork another part. And this is just an implementation of that. I don't think it's necessarily about uh, about um, resource uh, usage or anything like that. Um, so the f uh, the way that 9P works is uh, we have like these pretty much equivalents to the standard Unix system calls for files um, um, like walk for instance uh, walks down a file tree and open opens a file create creates a file and so on um, and these are just uh, th these are functions that every device in the kernel has to implement to uh, to work as a file server, and there is one device called dev mount, and in, in this device uh, translates these function calls in the kernel to uh, RPCs, so to the 9P protocol. So you can speak it over files, over a network, and so on. And um, this is what allows uh, the kernel to mount any program that speaks that 9P protocol. Uh, into a namespace. Like you can mount it from the kernel. The kernel is the client of that 9P server. Um, yeah, and 9P just has uh, an equivalent for pretty much each of these. Mm, it's not, not, not an exact match, I think, but it's pretty close. And uh, there is a T and R version of everything. So you have a, uh, you have a, um, a request. And then a, a reply to everything except for error. There's only uh, you can't request an error; just reply with an error. And there is a, a library uh, written in C, lib9p, where you take these messages, uh, like uh, like uh, the, the 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 encoded version of the RPC, and it turns it back into functions. So you have a nice interface you can use with it. Uh, these are some. Uh, some uh, of the file service that the kernel provides. And I picked a really bad font because L, pipe, and I look almost identical. <laughs> um, but yeah, so uh, so the, uh, you have the, the IP, for instance. Uh, you can see that. Here, all the, all the network stuff is here. So you have uh, Ethernet. That was the hash L thing. L stands for LANs, by the way. Um, and you have TCP. And to to open a network connection, you would just open this clone file, and then you get one of these. So every one of these directories here with the numbers uh, represents one network, one TCP connection. So you clone, the, you open the clone file, 
and it will create a new directory, like not, not literally create a directory on disk, but it's, it's visible in the file tree as a directory. And then you write some connection message to the file that you get, um, and then it will, or you, you listen or whatever, like TCP, um, TCP connection stuff. And then you get a file and you can read and write it, and it's just, looks like a file, but it's a network connection. Um, yeah, the, the slash proc, uh, slash proc uh, file system, for instance, is also one uh, that was, it was not, Plan 9 wasn't the first, uh, Unix, some version of Unix at Bell Labs also had it, and Linux actually, uh, I don't know if Linux took it from Unix or from Plan 9, I suspect from Plan 9, but I can, like, go to, I don't know, some process, and I will have all sorts of, uh, all sorts of files uh, to deal with it. Um, yeah, but th th this should be mostly familiar from Linux, actually, because that part of, of Linux was inspired by Plan 9. Um, okay, so I already uh, gave a quick overview of the versions, but uh, also like a little change log, maybe. Um, so the second edition introduced uh, a, a new text editor that was uh, that is actually kind of popular now, uh, not super popular, but uh, Acme, and it's inspired by uh, Oberon actually, um, and um, so first of all, the the user interface is very mouse driven on Plan Nine. Um, this was because it's inspired by Smalltalk and and the Blit and. It hasn't really changed much since the Blit days in the in the 80s. It still behaves quite similar. But uh, I have a file listing here, and if I do a right click on this directory, uh, it will just open this directory and uh, give me the um, give. There is some feeping noise here. It's really irritating. Uh, it will open the uh, uh, the directory and show me the files. So. I don't know, I have some PDP-11 emulator here, and then I can uh, open some file, I don't know. Uh, and with the middle mouse button, I can drag panes uh, around, and I can scroll, and, um, and, and the text you see up here uh, is to control the window. So if I uh, middle click on Dell, for instance, it will delete. But the text is not some hard-coded button, but if I, I can write Dell anywhere, and I, I can write my own Dell and then click that, and it works too. And I can write, I can write, uh, I don't know, I can write new here, and I get a new window. Uh, so that's kind of neat, and it, ha it has a lot of uh, funny features, and um, it's definitely worth uh, checking that out. Uh, it's quite, quite interesting as an editor. Um, so that was new in, in the second edition. Acid is the debugger. Um, uh, the third edition redid the whole uh, uh, graphics part, actually. Um, the original one was still inspired by the Blit, and it was only uh, um, a bitmap graphics, black and white. Um, and for the third edition, they, they redid the whole thing, uh, first of all, in color. And the semantics changed quite a bit as well. Um, I don't know if I can get into that, but uh, I don't I think I have anything about that. Um, but the old Windows system uh, essentially re-implemented this, uh, this drawing uh, file completely. Like it, uh, uh, how do you explain that? <laughs> it's quite hard. Um, so the, the BitBlit protocol uh, was used to, to draw on the screen. And the Windows system uh, implemented that whole BitBlit protocol just for a single window. So the, um, the program running in the window uh, has absolutely no idea that it's not running full screen. It just sees dev bitblit and uh, uses that to draw, uh, to draw pixels. Um, but the window system had to re-implement that whole protocol for every uh, window. And because you can uh, do things recursively, like I can run Rio in this window and I get a new window system, and I can hide this and um, so on. Um, because that was kind of inefficient, um, DevDraw actually handles the window multiplexing and the 
And the Windows system kind of manages these. So the neat, uh, transparent way the, the Windows system worked was, uh, was well, given up uh, to some degree uh, for efficiency. Uh, but it's still nice enough. Uh, the plumber is very interesting as well. Um, so let's see. Um, actually, let's let's kill that. That went. Oops, that was the that was the big window system. Sorry, <laughs> gonna re log in again. The exit button didn't used to be there. It's new. <laughs> it takes a while because it's uh, like over the network. It, it binds my my own. Um, my local directory. Actually, that's something I can show. Uh, so draw term is, uh, is a program that's quite interesting uh, because it provides these kernel files. It's, a, it's kind of a, a, a little Plan 9 kernel that has these device files and um, it logs into my machine at home, um, exports its own file system to that machine and there it runs the Windows system and it just opens dev cons, dev draw, whatever. And uh, like like it usually does, but it's really files on my laptop that it's uh, that it's opening, and it and it doesn't know. Uh, and in slash mount uh, term, I have my local laptop. So this is I, I I can deal with all my files that I have on my laptop from the machine at home running Plan 9 because it just exports the file system back home. Um, and and running Rio just opens the files and, and starts things. And the plumber, I wanted to get to the plumber, really. Uh, so actually, let's go to uh, maybe the kernel. So I don't know, some interesting file. Maybe this one. I can, uh, I can click on this, like put my cursor on this file and say plum. And it will know what to do. It will open a text editor. This is not Acme. This is Sam. Um, but it will open the file um, in, a, in a new text editor. And I can uh, do the same thing here, and it will reuse the text editor that already exists. Uh, so that's quite neat. And you can also do, I don't know, um, if we grab for something, I don't know, I just see lock here on the screen. That's enough. I, ca I can do something like this, plum, and it will actually go to the file number uh, that I like it, it, you can give patterns to this plumber and it, it understands what to do with those patterns uh, and kind of does the right thing. Uh, you can also use it to uh, to open PDF files or whatever. You just uh, click on the thing and say plum and it will just send it somewhere that knows how to handle it. And this is pretty neat. Um, so uh, the fourth edition uh, had a factotum, which is a, um, like the the... It's all about uh, authentication and cryptography and so on. It handles all these uh, all these uh, protocols, um, and programs don't really have to implement anything of that themselves. They just talk to Factotum and they forward all the messages, um, and Factotum will do it. Uh, Fossil and Venti was a uh, or is a file system. Uh, Fossil is for it's kind of like a, a cache for Venti. Venti is for uh, archiving. It's a it's a append only thing. Um, but in, in, in nine front, uh, those were removed because they were quite buggy at the time, um, and the old file server was kind of resurrected. So that that is uh, CWFS, HJFS. Um, uh, nine front got a new USB stack, a new security uh, like key exchange protocol because the other one was insecure, a new CPU. So CPU is like a remote login, uh, a new CPU um, thing. Uh, VMX is uh, for virtualization, so you can actually run like OpenBSD on Plan 9 as well. Uh, lots of device drivers and many smaller fixes and improvements and so on. And as I said, 9 Legacy is like a patch set for a fourth edition. Uh, a lot of it came from 9 front. Okay, so why didn't uh, Plan 9, why didn't it really succeed? Um, so compared to other operating systems, uh, Windows uh, uh, like had, had a lot of weight, uh, like Windows NT had a lot of weight uh, because Windows, I don't know, 3.1 was very, very popular and people, like it spread very quickly and it was, it was yeah, it was just very, uh, 
a very big operating system. Um, Unix kind of had been along, uh, had been uh, around for a very long time, and people had gotten used to it and depended on on the exact semantics of the operating system and so on. Linux got uh, probably uh, was probably successful because of the way that the development process worked, the uh, free software style, and it also uh, succeeded due to Unix being a re-implementation of Unix. But like, what had Ply9 going for it? Um, Hmm, good question. I mean, it, it, it's really nice, but um, maybe that just wasn't enough. And um, it was a research system, not a product. Um, and the license situation was not really great until like maybe 2000 or something, which, which was really late. Uh, so it didn't have a lot of early adoption and not too many people contributing to it. Um, and as a result of that, many things that we consider, uh, uh, yeah, th that we just expect to be there, uh, just aren't there. So like C++ <laughs> or a modern web browser. Um, so that, that might be a problem. Uh, but on the other side, the system is relatively pure and, um, and small and easy to grasp. Um, but the other problem is that, uh, like, Plan 9 was meant to, uh, uh, you have the whole, you have the network as the system. You don't have uh, these uh, monolithic uh, Unix machines where you log in with terminals, but you build your whole system out of uh, CPU servers, file servers, uh, terminal machines, and so on. And that kind of uh, didn't, like, it, it doesn't really fit with how we uh, work uh, with computers today, I guess. Um, but the good things, um, it's like a, yeah, it's, it's a nice iteration on Unix. Uh, many, many thoughts that went into Unix, uh, were really kind of, um, polished in plan nine, like, uh, thought through to, to the end. Uh, private namespaces are nice, uh, for, for various purposes. Uh, 9p is a very nice, easy protocol to talk uh, over files, and it's also used uh, elsewhere, not only in Plan 9. I think QMU uses it. Um, it has very nice abstractions compared to other operating systems, I think. Um, again, everything is a file, but uh, this time it, a bit more than, than in Unix. <laughs> Um, programs can really work together well on uh, Plan 9. Unix had this pipe idea where you pipe the input of one program, uh, the output of one program to the input of the next. And in Plan 9, um, this, this is even, this character is even, has a stronger character like this. Um, the code is pretty simple compared to, I don't know, Linux is huge, Plan 9 is pretty small. You can compile the whole system in like five minutes on a reasonably fast machine. Um, like kernel, user space, everything takes maybe five or ten minutes. Uh, you can pretty much understand the whole system uh, from like the boot process to I don't know, whatever. Uh, and you can learn a lot from it. And there's still quite a lot of low hanging fruit, I think, um, to uh, things to improve, things to add to it. Uh, and of course, it's fun. Um, there's some legacy. Uh, UTF-8 uh, was originally invented for Plan 9. Uh, I think Ken Thompson converted the whole system to Plan 9 and uh, the whole Plan 9 system to UTF-8 in like a night or something uh, after inventing UTF-8. Uh, <laughs> uh, the slash proc file system, uh, you know it from Linux, um, it came from Plan 9 or earlier Unix actually. Uh, you have something like, uh, you have user space file systems on Linux as well. It's called Fuse there. Um, maybe inspired by 9P, I don't know. Um, private namespaces in Linux do exist, but they're not really, they're not really the same. They're, they're meant to be like, they're meant to cage you in to have like separation of processes and then, uh, in Plan 9, you have, uh, like, it's a different idea. The, the reason for them being in the system is different. Uh, the Go programming language uh, was uh, done by, by pretty much the same people. Uh, Rob Pike and Thompson, Russ Cox, uh, originally uh, did 
Plan 9 and then uh, use the Plan 9 C compiler uh, to, to bootstrap Go. And there is a user space port of a lot of the Plan 9 stuff uh, to Unix, and it was done by Ross Cox. And here are some links. There is a, a demo of the Blit, which is quite famous. Um, <coughs> maybe, you've, uh, maybe you've seen it. Plan 9 Foundation, uh, old Bell Labs um, website. 9 front 9 leg legacy, and there's a lot of uh, Unix and Plan 9 related stuff uh, on uh, catv.org. Uh, I don't know, I only have five more minutes, I think. Um, but I already showed some demos, so I don't know if, uh, if you want to see anything else or if you have questions, maybe that's the time for it now. Yes. Uh, <coughs> I read from a file. Is this just like on a normal Unix system, or does the user space process have to speak 9p as no. a client? No, no, 9p is uh, uh, handled, uh, like the client part of 9p is handled in the kernel. Um, and if you have an open, uh, like open and read system calls, um, this will go to the mount device in the kernel, and the mount device. Um, will generate the, the 9p messages and send them, like write them to the file or read them from the file. And uh, the, file ser the file server uh, runs in user space. So there you actually have to implement a protocol yourself. But there's a library which, uh, which facilitates it. Um, there's still some, some work to do, but uh, it's not so hard. Like you can write a, a simple a demo file server, like some some simple functionality, in I don't know, maybe 100 or 200 lines of code. Mm -hmm. uh, how many lines of code does the system have? Oh, let's see. Uh, you mean Sorry. everything or just the kernel? Well, everything would be more interesting, yeah. Oof. Uh, I don't know if I can easily do that. No. Uh, I don't know, but I, I think I can probably... Oops. I can, I can tell you the kernel. Uh, so the portable part of the kernel is uh, 70,000 lines. And uh, the... The device drivers for uh, like standard PC stuff is a bit more, but uh, still still under 200,000 lines total for the for a whole kernel. And then the user space, yeah, it depends. I mean, we have Ghost script for PDFs and uh, and PostScript, and that's like the main bulk of the system. Like I don't know, 50% of the system is just Ghost script. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, you said at some point that the licensing situation was a bit complicated, and um, I would like to know what the intention was, what Bell Labs thought they would be producing. I think Bell Labs uh, did not have any experience with open source or free software. Uh, I mean, the lic licensing situation with Unix was also complicated already, and they were just very cautious and didn't want didn't want people to use their stuff too much, I guess. They wanted to kind of make a profit or, I don't know, uh, I, I can't say, but uh, I think the way that the Unix situation played out was kind of similar and they were just very restrictive at that time. Oh, there is a fun story. Uh, Ken actually wanted to include a lot of his uh, music uh, collection on the Plan 9 CDs uh, in a new uh, file format that they developed at Bell Labs. Um, but the lawyer department, the law department at Bell Labs said, nope. So we didn't get the music. <laughs> okay, that seems to be all. Okay, thank you.